How many of you, um, like me, sometimes feel like you live in a foreign country? This is not the America that I grew up in. As a child, I enjoyed freedoms that I do not enjoy today. Partly out of, we have get, had to give up some of our freedoms because of, in the name of safety. Because we live in a world that, quite frankly, seems to have gone crazy. I believe that's the way the church felt when Peter was writing to them. What happened? You know, they enjoyed those first few years in Jerusalem. Man, the church was growing. Uh, everybody was, was on fire for Jesus Christ. Uh, it was awesome. They were having great fellowship, going from house to house, breaking bread together and meeting needs of one another. It was awesome. And then all of a sudden, one day, chaos broke loose. Nero saw that it was it pleased the Jews to persecute the Christians. And so he went crazy. That was who was in, that was the one who was persecuting the church that I just read about. And today, we, we, it seems that everywhere you turn, that every idea that we have in the world is tolerated except those things that have to do with honoring God and speaking the name of Jesus Christ. I believe these four imperatives we find in verse 17 can speak to us today as how we are to live. How are we to be good citizens in a land where we feel like sojourners and pilgrims? You understand we have dual citizenship, right? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, physically you are a citizen of uh, of where you are living, so we, you know, if we're citizens of the United States, then, then we have our physical citizenship here in the United States, and we have some things that we're supposed to do as citizens to be good citizens. But ultimately, spiritually, we have our, our primary citizenship is that of, of in the kingdom of God. And that's where our primary allegiance lies. And as Daniel Webster said, those things that make us good Christians make us good citizens. And these four things uh, in this verse, in verse 17, I want to break them down for us and, and, uh, and share a little bit about them. The first thing that we have, and these are all imperatives, they are, they are commands, these are non-negotiables that, uh, in, that are present here in God's Word. And first of all, we see, we see honor all people. Your translation may say honor all men. Uh, the, the Greek word there is not anthropos, it is not the word for male or men, it is the, the Greek word pantane, which means all or everybody or everyone. So honor everyone. The word honor means to, to ascribe value to, to see something as being valuable so we as God's people even in the midst of people that we don't agree with and we don't like um, uh, you know you got family like that, right? That you have to love, but you don't necessarily like them. You know? um, but we, as God's people, are called to honor all people. We're called to see value in every human being. Why? Because they are created in the image of God. Whether they're a different color than us, speak a different language than us, of a different uh, socioeconomic background than us, whether they agree with our lifestyle or we agree with their lifestyle, it does not matter. We are to honor that person and see them as valuable because God, they bear the image of God. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for them as much as he did for me. We don't have to agree with everything. But we do have to value them and honor them. And God tells us here in his word. In, in 1 Peter 17. The very first thing there is honor everyone. Honor all people. 35th president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Said this. 
The rights of man do not come from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. He recognized that people are created in the image of God. And God is the one who ascribes value to people and gives us our rights as human beings. We honor all people because all people are created in the image of God. The second thing that we are to do and we're commanded to do here in verse 17 is to love the brotherhood. Now that simply means that we, are, we have a special bond as believers in Jesus Christ. There is a special bond between us. We're, we're to honor all people, but specifically we are to love the brotherhood unconditionally. That's the word love there is the Greek word agape, which means unconditional love, a sacrificial love, an active love. We are to serve one another, take care of one another's needs. We are to help one another. We're, we're to love all people, but specifically, more importantly, there's a special bond between believers and Jesus Christ because we both are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And as we meet together, it's the, it's the reason that I can go to places like Haiti and I can worship with believers in Jesus Christ. I can't understand a stinking word they're saying, but we can have a good time in the Lord. Because their spirit bears witness with the spirit within me, and it's the same spirit. I can go to Haiti, I can go to Bulgaria, I can go uh, to, to Mexico, I can go anywhere in the world. And I can witness, and I can worship, and I can have fellowship with believers in Jesus Christ. Because we, have, we are indwelt with the same spirit. And we have a special bond and we are commanded to love one another and to take care of one another. Jesus said in John 13 verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. He's talking to believers here. He's not talking uh, to, to just anybody. He's talking about those who are following him. He says, you love one another as I have loved you. If I, as I have come and I have served you. In another place, he says, I've not come to be served. I've come to serve. And Jesus is saying here, as I have loved you, as I have sacrificed for you, as I have provided for you, if I, as I have taken care of you, you love one another. For by this, all will know that you are my disciples when you have love for one another. So many times the churches get caught up in, in fussing and feuding among one another. I don't like the way we do it over there, so I'm going to go over here. Well, I don't like the color of the carpet, so I'm just going to, you know, start laying another church across the street. Yeah. Some things have absolutely no eternal significance whatsoever. You know that? We're supposed to concentrate on the main thing. And the main thing is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and loving one another, taking care of one another. When Jesus said that, he said, the, the whole world's going to know who you are by the way you treat one another. If you're fussing and feuding among yourselves, that's going to put a bad taste in their mouth about me and my church. But Jesus said, if you'll, if you'll love one another the way I loved you, sacrificially, you'll look out for one another, you'll take care of one another, You'll, you'll hug on one another. That's going to show the world that there's something special about my people and my church. And it's attractive. They're going to want some of it. I believe that's one of the reasons people want to come to the United States because of its founding. It was founded on Christian principles. There is no nation in the world that is more benevolent than the United States of America. We have helped rebuild more nations that have been torn down in war. Go back and look at the history. Uh, look at how we fought during World War II. Germany was destroyed. Japan was destroyed. Who helped them to rebuild? It was the United States of America. 
Why? Because that's part of the benevolence that's been ingrained in us as believers in Jesus Christ. It's part of our heritage. We help one another. We help rebuild for the glory of God. Love the brotherhood. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. The third thing is fear God. Fear God. James Madison, our fourth president, said we have staked the whole future of American civilization not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the whole of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government upon the capacity of, which, with, of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the commandments of God. The future and success of America is not in its constitution but in the laws of God upon which its constitution is founded. James Madison recognized that we need to have a reverent fear of God. The constitution upon which we we ascribe so much value is nothing but a worthless piece of paper except for the fact that the things contained within it are based upon the laws of God. That's one thing that makes us a great nation. In order to be a a, a good citizen in this great nation, you must fear God. You have to. You have to understand who God is, that He is the one who literally spoke and everything that is was created. He is the one who has the power to kill, uh, not just to destroy Uh, uh, to kill your your body but to destroy your body and soul in hell he has that power now he has told us that if we would he has made a way for us as sinful men to have a relationship with him and we do that by believing in jesus christ his son you see we are to fear him because he is deserving in spite of all of our imperfections, God still desires us. He still loves us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In spite of who Charlie Higgins is, In spite of his selfish desires, in spite of his wicked thoughts, in spite of the the, the things that he uh, constantly is, is, uh, the promises that he breaks to God. God, I'm going to be better in this area of my life, and I find myself just messing up. But in spite of that, God still loves me, and he still loves you, in spite of yourself. The Bible tells us that we've all sinned. We've all messed up. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. But God still loves us. And he just just doesn't love us in word. He didn't just say, well, I love you, and then leave it at that. His love is an action-oriented love. He demonstrated his love for us. Romans 5, 8 tells us that specifically. But God demonstrates his love for us. And that while he, we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. And this salvation is available to everyone. God desires for us all. To be saved. Romans 10 13 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I like that word shall. Some translations put it as will, but there's something just, it, you go back to the, the old King James and, and New King James, and, and, and that word shall, there's just something definitive about it. Thou shalt be saved. You know, it's so final. God says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever. Fat little white boy from eastern Kentucky, if he calls on the name of the Lord, he'll be saved. That the best person you can think of, they call upon the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. 
the worst person you can think of. If they would call upon the name of the Lord, God's word promises he will be saved. It's a promise of God. Well, how do you do it? What, what do you have to know in order to be saved? Well, if you back up a few verses from that Romans 10, 13, you go to Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you believe in what God said, in what Jesus did for you, that he came, he lived a perfect life. He died voluntarily on the cross in your place. He was buried. The third day afterwards, he came back to life. If you believe that with your heart, and you'll confess him as your Lord with your mouth. The Bible says you will be saved. Of course, it's with the heart you believe. So at this time, point, I want to ask you just to, to, to bow your head uh, right now, just where you are. Just, just stay right there. I don't need the instruments or anyone to come up or anything. Just right where we are. If you're here today and, you, and your desire is to be saved, you know, God's desire is to save you. Because the Bible tells us that no one comes unless they are drawn. You can't even want to be saved unless God wants to save you. So if you're here and you want to be saved, know this, God wants to save you. He loves you. He gave his very best for you. His son, Jesus Christ, came and died for you. He was buried and he came back to life for you. So that one day, when either he comes back and gets you, or your heart stops beating and you go to be with him, you will be in his presence for eternity. You can have that gift of salvation. I'm not praying a prayer something like this. No magic in the words. The intent of your heart. Dear Lord Jesus. I want to be saved. I agree with you that I'm a sinner. And I believe that you came. You lived. You died. And you rose again for me. Thank you. Please forgive me. Take over my life. Help me, Lord Jesus, to live for you every day. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So in order to be a good citizen, Peter commands us to honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. And then he finishes it up with something that's interesting. He says, honor the king. We don't have a king uh, in, in our political system. We have a president. But while we're called to fear God, we're called to honor the king. And that word honor, remember, it means to ascribe value to. To see your, those who are placed in government above you as deserving of honor. Thomas Jefferson, our third president, says the reason that Christianity is the best friend of government is because Christianity is the only religion that changes the heart. When we look at our governmental system, it is only with a changed heart that some people are able to bring themselves to honor the politicians whom they do not respect. Honor and respect are two different things. We're called to honor our parents, but you know, there are some parents who are not worthy of respect. You know, some, some of you know that very, all too well. 
You see parents like we see on the news sometimes. Who, the man who was just sentenced for killing a five-year-old child. Because he was disciplining him. And it went too far. But we are called as God's people to honor our parents. You can honor your parents without respecting them. I have a friend who I went to college with. He just posted uh, something on Facebook. His father died. It was the saddest thing I'd ever read. He said, my father died. He was not a good man. He had been estranged from us, from his children and his wife for over 25 years. Not a word out of him. Nothing. Until in his old age he decided he didn't want to be alone and so he tried to reconcile things and and he came back into our lives and it was hard steve honored his father by attempting to repair the relationship but he never never came to the place where he could respect his father because his father was still the same father that he had known as a child Hard, mean, lonely man. It was sad. But he honored his father. We can honor people without respecting them. We are called as God's people to honor those whom have been put, set above us in, um, in, in, in our government. From the mayor all the way up to the president. Whether we agree with him or not, we don't have to agree with the president. But we are called to honor the president. There was a day in our nation where even if you did not agree with the president or the mayor or the governor or whatever, you still honored that person. You you still showed them even respect. You didn't talk bad about them. You, you held in high esteem the office which they held. Today, we have um, our president uh, and our nation seems to be uh, more divided today than it ever has been. There are those who, who just, you know, Donald Trump can do no wrong. You know. And then there's the other camp where Donald Trump can do no right. You know how it is. But we're not called to like the man. We're called to honor him. We're called to pray for him. Listen to what 1 Timothy, Paul writes Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. It says, Therefore I exhort first of all that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority. Why, he, I wonder. Now he goes on to explain why we're to pray for the kings and all who are in authority over us. Pray that they have God's wisdom. Pray that, that, that we will be able to, to have a, a peaceful nation. And, and it says there, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. We have to pray for our nation and for our leaders. Like them or not. I preached the same thing eight years ago when we had another president, President Obama, who there were those who thought President Obama can do no wrong. Then there was the other camp, President Obama can do no right. We still have the same command, regardless of the man that is sitting in that office, because the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that God is the one who places kings on thrones. He is the one, and so we can translate that today in in today's uh, political arena. God is the one who places the president in the White House. God is the one who places the governor in Tallahassee. God is the one who places the mayor in Sanford. He is the one who places uh, those over us in authority. And so we are called to honor them, to pray for them, to... um, Support as much as possible them. Paul in 
First Timothy is simply echoing the command of Jeremiah. We find in Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 4, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. So Jeremiah is writing to the, the, uh, the Jews who had been um, abducted from Jerusalem, carried off to Babylon. Who's one of those guys that were carried off to Babylon? That we know very well. It has to do with lions. And a lion's den. It would be Daniel. He had three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were carried off to Babylon as well. Daniel was good friends with three kings. He was was a a, a confidant. He was an advisor, a a wise man in Babylon. And, And Jeremiah is writing to those exiles in Babylon, and he's telling them this. This is the word of the Lord. This is what God is telling me to tell you. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be, you may be increased there and not diminished. In other words, God is saying, look, everything you did in Jerusalem, everything you did in Israel, do it in Babylon. And do it to my honor and to my glory. And then do this. Verse 7, it says, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray for it. For its peace is your peace. So today, when we live in this uh, day and age where so many times we, we feel like it, we li- we're living in Babylon, you know. Man, it's a you flip on the TV. Oh, dude, wouldn't have seen that when I was a child. Change the channel. We live in this day and age where we we seem to be uh, living in a strange place. And our reaction as human beings is to to rail against it and to fight against it. And God's word tells us what you need to be doing is praying. You need to pray for your leaders. You need to pray for your nation. You need to pray that you'll have peace and prosperity. Because the peace of the place where you live is your peace. Peace. So today, what we want to do is a little different uh, ending to our service. Than-